So now we're at John chapter 9 today, and it's only a couple months until the crucifixion of Jesus. So he's just, he's, it, it, his time is near. And because of that, Jesus is no longer shy about proclaiming who he is. He was never really shy, but he was very intentional with the timing of his teaching and choosing his words carefully because he knew he had some things to accomplish before his crucifixion but if you go read john chapter 8 the chapter previous to the one that we're going to be reading today he's like no longer hiding anything he's making statements that bring him to equality with the father telling telling him like i and the father are one he, he said he was pre-existent he outdates abraham that he was there in the beginning and he even called himself the great i am and used the i am that god is and so at this they're like astounded they're so mad the religious leaders now they're like actively plotting they were secretly maybe plotting up to that point in john chapter 8 but now they're just actively full court pressing they're they're literally they're they're just trying to find a way to murder him to to kill him he's a threat to their to their power to their regime to their religious system and so they want to get rid of him and that's where we're picking up now in John chapter 9 and the miracle that we're going to be studying is the man who was born blind the man who was born blind we're going to study his healing we're going to study what happened there and there's a lot that I think we can take and there's going to be a portion of the service that's like man what can we learn from his healing but then in John chapter 9 we're also going to study the second part of the chapter where he's actually interrogated by the Pharisees and then Jesus even comes back and bring some truth and insight that we're going to glean from today. Y'all ready for this? Come on. You all ready? Amen? All right. John chapter 9, starting at verse 1, you guys. All, it says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Verse 2 says his disciples asked him, which was a very interesting question. I want to pause here for just a moment. They go, Rabbi, who sinned? Like, did this man, because he's obviously, who did that? He's in a, he's in a condition. Who's Whose fault was it that he's suffering like he is? Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? Now, this was a popular false belief, like a wrong belief, but it was very popular in Judaism. It's probably a misinterpretation of the Old Testament law um, about generational sins and curses that they just didn't understand. So they're attributing every time something bad happens, either you did something bad or your parents especially if someone was born that way maybe it was ancestral someone did something bad it had to have been and it wasn't it just in judaism though it was also in like the stoic philosophy even the roman culture believed this but again this isn't even something that is exists pre like a long time ago thousands of years this is something that still exists today like how many of you here uh when your child does something bad you blame yourself you have ever done that okay here it is we all, the human propensity, when there is a dilemma that we don't have the answer for, is to find someone to blame. We're always looking for someone to blame, and they're going, well, was it mom's fault? Was it, was it dad's fault? So sometimes when our kids do something bad, parents can even go, man, what did, what did I do wrong? Or maybe, have you ever, like, had other people secretly whispering behind your back? Oh, I thought she was a Christian. Look at her kids. Oh, I thought, look at him. He said he changed his life and got all churchy and stuff. Look at those kids. Okay. So who sinned? They say, who sinned? Whose fault? Whose fault is it that I find myself in this dilemma? Because this isn't an ideal situation. This does not reflect the belief system that obviously I have. I mean, I mean, this isn't this is not an ideal situation. Yet here I am in a p very public situation. And you can't hide being blind. This is a public thing. You can hide being broke, but you can't hide being blind. But whenever you cannot explain a dilemma, people look for people. To blame but here's the problem with blaming other people like blaming them when you blame your mom or you blame your dad the problem with blaming them for what is happening in your life right now you also have to submit to the reality that if they did it they're the only ones that could fix it and that's too much power to give any person to say that you have to repent for me to be well that's too much power look i love you but that's too much power to give you you, you have to repent for you to get well, but you don't have to repent for me to get well. That will put me at your mercy. So Jesus kind of uh, uh, corrects them, and he says, well, neither, neither. Don't blame his mama. She can't heal him. Don't blame your daddy. He can't heal you. 
Don't blame yourself even because you can't even heal yourself. He goes, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But look what he said. But this happened so that. This happened, this suffering happened in his life so that the works of God or the power or the glory of God, the translation there, might be displayed in him. I want you to see the paradox here. The blindness is a blindness created for glory. I want to talk to someone who can't see today. That where you're at right now, you don't know where to take the next step. You don't know what the next step for your life is or for your problem is and your situation is. You might even be afraid to take the next step. But I want you to know today that God is going to get some glory out of this. That I came to tell you your crisis is a setup for the glory of God. That pain often has a purpose. And oftentimes it's divine. Jesus' pain had a purpose. This man's pain had a purpose, and quite possibly the pain that you find yourself in today has a purpose. In other words, write this down. Sometimes God chooses to display his power on the platform of your pain. God chooses to display his glory on the platform of your pain. And you've probably seen this to where someone's pain actually caused your faith to get bigger. Where you saw someone experiencing something that was hard, but the way they handled it. Because it's not the people who are living wrinkle-free lives that actually inspire you. It's the people who are going through extraordinarily difficult circumstances, yet their faith is rock solid. That makes you want to be a better follower of Jesus. That even if you don't even know Jesus or believe in Jesus, it'll make you curious. Or even just want to be a better person because of how someone is enduring the pain. This man was born blind for the glory of God. And I don't know who this is for this morning. I don't know who's been groping around in the darkness. I don't know who's like, like stuck right now saying, for where I am, I should have been further. For my age, I should have done more. For what I have, I could have been a lot. And you feel like you're groping in the darkness and you're wondering, I don't know if I'll ever be happy. I don't know if I'll ever be free. I don't know if I'll ever be out of debt. I don't, I don't know if I'll ever be able to see. I don't know if I'll ever be whole. But will I ever? Listen to me. God is going to get some glory out of this. Amen. He let you be blind. He let you be broke. He let you be humiliated. He let you be embarrassed. He let you suffer. And he let everybody see the suffering too. And he let them gossip about you. See, he needed it to go public. Because when the Lord turns it around, come on somebody, it's going to be for the glory of God. I wonder if you've ever considered that. I wonder if you've ever considered this theological implication here. That maybe your blindness, that maybe your barrenness, that maybe your emptiness, your loneliness, your unhappily marriedness, come on somebody, is for the glory of God. That God, is that this happened so that God would get glory from it. And he lets you do everything you can to try to fix it yourself. And he let it not work. And he lets you try to go to other people that try to help, and he let it not work. So that you would understand, and your eyes would be open, that the only way this is going to get fixed is from the hand of God. I know it's tough right now for some of you, but it's going to be for the glory of God. I know it's hard right now for some of you, but it's going to be for the glory of God. I know you're crying right now. But it's going to be for the glory of God. I know you're embarrassed right now over what happened. But it's going to be for the glory of God. I know it's not the house that some of you want. But it's going to be for the glory of God. I know you're not at your dream job right now. But it's going to be for the glory of God. I know, I know you're suffering right now. But it's going to be for the glory of God. See, God will use suffering to get glory. But how does he do it? How does that work? How does God get glory from our suffering? Let me give you a few ways, okay? Write, some, write these down. Number one, here's one way. Suffering can actually equip you. Now, I want to tell you this. Listen, suffering can equip you like success never will. 
If all you experience is success and not suffering, you're not as mature or strong as you think you are. Suffering will equip you. You know how you get credentials or a degree to speak into a pain or a specific suffering? You got to join the club. You got to enroll in that course of suffering. And when you do, and when you go through the storm and the trial and the pain and the adversity, and you get on the other side of that thing, it equips you in such a way that you have firsthand awareness that you're able to speak into and see into something that you had never been able to do from the sidelines. That suffering, unlike success, can equip you like nothing else in life. This is what Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. Thank God for that. But there's, a, there's another so that. Look what he says. So that. Why did you comfort us, God, in all of our troubles? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the very comfort that we receive from God. That when we suffer and we go through it, when God gives us comfort and we get on the other side, that it actually, on the other side of this thing, is ministry for you. God equips you for ministry through suffering and trials. He equips you for it. So how can God use the suffering? How is he getting glory from it? He's equipping you. That's what he's doing. Here's the second thing he's doing. God can use suffering to strengthen you. I like to work out. Anyone here like to work out? Anyone here like to work out? To to work out, though, if you like working out to a degree, you have to like suffering. Right? Right? Some of you don't work out because you're like, why? Yeah. It's like, like, why do that to yourself? You know what I mean? Why? Why so? Look, and it's not a suffering for suffering's sake. We, it's suffering for a glory. It's a suffering, listen to me, that produces a strength that the comfort zone will never give you. So you can stay in the comfort of your bed, but I'm getting up and suffering in the morning. Come on, somebody. I'm going to suffer a little bit. You can stay in the comfort of your couch, but I'm going to go into the gym and suffer a little bit so I can produce, it can produce a strength. It's suffering for glory. That's what it is. Suffering can strengthen you. That's why James says, count it all joy when you endure trials of, of many kinds. Second Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul again, he's actually talking about his own suffering. He says, to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Now, we don't know exactly what he was meaning when he said a thorn in the flesh, but it was something something that produced suffering, pain, an ailment that he called a messenger of Satan to torment him and to keep him from becoming proud. Here's what he did. He said three times, three different times, I, I, I begged the God of miracles, the God who could do anything and nothing is impossible. I begged him to do what only he could do. And each time, look what it says, each time he said, my grace is all you need. And then he told him why. Because my power works best in your weakness. That there's something that when you are suffering and when you are weak and when you are in need, that produces a strength and a resolve and a perseverance and a steadfastness inside of you that only suffering can produce. Remember the secret of the storm last week. That there's only certain lessons that you can learn to go through The storm, suffering can strengthen you. Here's the third thing suffering can do. Suffering can course correct you. How many of you ever felt the hand of God correct you? Okay, all right, that'll happen. Now, don't get it twisted. These guys in this day and age, remember, every time there was suffering and trials and pain, they would say, well, you did something to deserve it. That's not what I'm saying here, but it is very, very clear that in the scripture that God will and can use suffering in our life to course correct correct us like like your parents used to do my mom used to spank me you know when you used to get spankings do we still do that you know you, okay okay <laughs> you know what I mean so Psalm 119 actually verse 67 talks about that like like it, it can of course suffering can actually course correct us it's it's in our God will use it in our life to correct us before he says I was afflicted before I had to endure the consequences of my choices Before I had to reap what I sowed, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, now I know better. Now I obey. Does anyone have a testimony of a before but now? Before, but now, I know. Anyone? 
before I got married. But now, before I had kids, mm, but now I'm, okay? Be before, before I, that's what he's saying here. It's, it's just before that consequence of my choices or my actions and my affliction came. Like I just wandered, but now because of the suffering and the course correction, I obey your word. So suffering, God can use it. He'll use it as a platform. Of his power, his glory, your pain. So these guys got it wrong, right? They're like, oh, who sinned? He's, he's obviously born blind. Jesus corrects him. No, no, no. This is for the glory, the glory of God to be made manifest in his life. Let's pick it up. Verse 4 now. Verse 4. Back to John chapter 9. Jesus tells him, we must quickly carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. And he's talking about when he's going to be leaving, just trying to prepare them. Verse 5 says, but while I'm here in the world, I am the what? I am the light of the world. And I want you to picture that. Here's this blind man who can't see, never seen light. And Jesus says, no, no, I am the light of the world. The world. And, and then he does something very weird. Just weird, okay? Um, he spits on the ground, and he makes mud with the saliva, and he rubbed it in the guy's eyes. Now, I could theorize all this and, like, you know, theologize it, too. And I could probably, there's some implication I can draw out of that. Could it be right? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I'm not even going to go there with you guys. I'm not. I'm not even going to. Here's all I will say is this. Don't let the mess make you miss the miracle. Okay? Because, because God will bring things to you, not packaged in the way that you desire. Uh, uh, and so it might even come to you messy, all right? And some of you will let the mess, because it wasn't packaged right or presented to you right, it make, it's making you miss the miraculous that God intends to do. So that's all I'm going to say about that. The rest of it's just weird. Another time for that, okay? Here we go. He tells him, he does that. He puts this stuff in his eyes, right? And I want you to picture that, right? He spits on that ground, makes some mud. He shoves it in his eyes, like he's rubbing it in his face. And, eh. And then he tells him, he goes, he goes, now go. Go away, go, go, wash, wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Picture that. Jesus here, he's touching him, he's down, like, and then he tells him, don't stay here, go over there. Blind. Go away from me. Get out of here. Go wash. Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed. And came back seen. There are some other truths that we can, I think we need to pull from this. Because I want you to understand that even when you cannot see your way clear, you have to, number one, write this down. You got to go by what you hear. <laughs> Sometimes you have to go forward blind to get to your healing. This guy, literally, it's a foreshadowing, right? He is literally walking by faith and not by sight. This man was blind, but he wasn't deaf, Right? He could, he could still hear, and when one thing breaks down, you got to work with what's left. Did you hear that? I said when one thing breaks down, you got to work with what's left. Here, write this down. You don't need anything you lost or that left you to bless you. You don't need anything. Jesus said, I don't need either of your eyes. You're going to go by what you hear. You don't need your eyes to get to the pool. You don't need your eyes to get you where I want you to be. Jesus said, you don't need it. You're going to go by what you hear, which is why you need to be careful who's Speaking into your ear, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Again, this was just foreshadowing every one of us how much faith is important. For we walk by faith and not by, so you don't need your eyes to get to the pool. I don't need anything I lost to get to where God has called me to be. I didn't need my dad to raise me for me to get to where God has called me to be. I didn't need my mom to love me. To get me to where God has called me to be. I didn't need my parents to stay married happily together and not divorced. For God to get me where he has called me to be. God says, I'm going to bring you into your destiny. And we're going to do it by ear. We're going to do it by what's left. So I want you to hear. Rather than crying about what you lost, start going by what you have. So stop saying, I can't get there because, oh, so and so didn't go there. Didn't help me get there. I can't, I, can't, I can't get there because so-and-so didn't raise me, right? I can't get there because so-and-so didn't love me. And I can't, I can't get there because I'm too old. I'm too old now. I can't get there because I'm too young. I can't get there because stop it. 
You may have to go there differently. You may have to go there slower. You may have to go there crawling. You may have to get there crying. But you better keep going to where God has called you to be. And you may have to go there based on what you hear, not on what you see. you got to go by what you hear. Walk by faith and not by sight. Which brings me to the second point I want to share with you guys. And that is that every step is a blessing. To the blind men, every step was a blessing. It's not about the destination. It wasn't about the destination. Room. It, was, it was that just taking the next step without falling. That was, that was so, so here's, don't delay your praise for the finish line. Every time you take a step, you need to give God praise because every step is a blessing. Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. He said, I don't consider myself to yet gotten there yet. I haven't gotten there. I'm still a long ways away from that thing. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on. I press, Paul said. I press, I press, I press to every person who's working from a deficit in this season. Hey, you need to, you need to start pressing on. You, this is, you gotta, you gotta press. Every time you take a step, you gotta stop and say, God, I thank you for another step. I know I'm not there yet, but I thank you for another step. God, I, I know I'm not totally free yet, but I thank you for another step. God, I know I'm not fully out of debt yet, but I thank you for another step. God, I know my marriage isn't exactly where I want it to be, but thank you for another step. Someone needs to praise God right now for another step. Come on, come on. Here's the third thing I want you to see, and that is the salve didn't work, the mud didn't work, the touch didn't work, talking didn't work. The word only works if you work it. The word only works if you work it. Victory only works if you work it. Deliverance only works if you work it. God isn't going to do it for you. He's going to do it with you. It only works if you work it. James chapter 2, 26, he says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is what? Is dead. It only works if you work it. You can hear it all day long, but if you don't do it, it ain't going to work for you. I could teach you all day long, but if you don't apply the principles, it's not going to work for you. I can give you the recipe, but you can't eat the recipe. Come on, somebody. You, you're trying to eat the recipe. That's just the ingredients, baby. Turn to your neighbor and say, work it. Work that thing. Tell him, work that thing. I'm going to get you a date right now. Work that thing. Or get you punched in the face. We either one. I'm sorry, bro. Because you've been shouting about it. It's time for you to work it. You've been hearing it. You've been listening to it. But it's time for you to work it. You've been dreaming about it, too. You've been imagining about it. It's time for you to work it now. Because it don't work unless you work it. You've been, some of you have been teaching about it, but you need to work it. Oh, it surprises me how many people can teach it, but aren't working it. Oh, my goodness. This story continues, this interrogation of this man who was born blind. The Pharisees start to interrogate him, and this blind man comes back seeing. Where did he go back to? Verse 8 tells us actually where he goes back to. It says his neighborhood. So he actually, when he came back seeing, he went home. He went to his neighborhood. And there, all the others, his neighbors who knew him as a blind beggar, asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. How many of you, can, how many of you have, have God done such a transformation in your life that you don't even look like that old? That's an old shadow of who you were, right? This is what happened to this guy. He's just like totally transformation. And the, the beggar kept saying, no, I, I'm him. That's me. So they asked him, what happened here? Go ahead, next verse. They asked him, who healed you? What happened? Verse 11. He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes. Apparently, he didn't know he spit in the mud, which is probably a good thing that he didn't, probably better for him. He might have, get that out of my face, you know. But, or, or, or he just was embarrassed and didn't want to share that detail. I don't know, for whatever. But he's like, the guy had some mud and Jesus, he put over my eyes and he told me, Go to the pool, you know, walk my blind self to the pool. Can you believe it? He told me, like, go myself to the pool. And I went and washed, and now I can see. And I think this is funny. He says this. They go, they go where is he now? They ask. And he goes, bro, I was blind. 
I don't know. You know what I mean? I think that's just hilarious when you read the Bible that way. It's just like, he's like, bro, I just, I barely started seeing right now, okay? I don't know where he went. <laughs> verse, verse 14. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and had opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. There it is again, kind of the problem. So what some of the Pharisees said, well, there it is. This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. And so and it wasn't really the, the, the Sabbath as instituted by God. At this time, they had an oral tradition, an oral law. And so they had, at this time, they had just put such a heavy burden upon the people that they made the, the Sabbath like, Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so what these Pharisees do and the religious leaders did is they put so many restrictions on the people that it wasn't really a restful day of worship and reflection, something to enjoy. It was so oppressive that it was like, you couldn't even enjoy the day. It just became something that God never intended at all the Sabbath to be. It never intended that to be. But because of that, and because he actually made mud, they said. So, it, so what he did, because he spit in, in the mud, he technically, he kneaded. K-N-E-A-D-E-D. -E -E so he was kneading mud, which you could not do any work on the Sabbath. He was kneading, is what it is. Ah, ha, 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 no. Broke the, how can he be of God? If you ain't going to follow the rules. I can't go God. No, he's, he ain't not following the rules. He's not from, he's not from God. So I got, I got a few insights that I think that we need to learn from this interrogation part of this story that I just want to give it to us in, in a, I don't know, a form of a warning because it's, it's the perspective of the Pharisees. So here, write it down like this. Be careful that the law doesn't block out the light. Be careful you're so focused on the rule that it's, it's blocking out the relationship, blocking out what God intends to do. Like we can get so religious in our ways. And some, some people think it's their job and duty to be like inspectors of people's business or the church's business and like figure out what's wrong and correct it you know what a tip like like that be careful that the law that you're focusing on doesn't block out the light of life that's trying to shine in so here's here let me give you not in your notes colossians chapter 2 verse 16 and 17 shed some light on this whole sabbath thing I think didn't, like, this isn't the first time we've encountered the Sabbath and Jesus somehow breaking the Sabbath rule and the Sabbath law. So I wanted to make sure you guys have a proper understanding of the Sabbath. Because yes, it was on a Saturday and it was a day that they had of rest and it was very restrictive. In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, after Christ and what he instituted, we practice the principle and the spirit of the Sabbath on Sunday. It's the day of the resurrection and since the church started, that's the day that we celebrate and worship and rest is on the first day, which is Sunday. And so, but some people are like, wait a second, are we breaking the law here, the rule? No. Jesus, when Jesus came on the scene, you got to understand that he was coming and bringing an entire different paradigm of relating to God. So he would say things like, you've heard it said, I say unto you. You've heard it said, I say unto you. And so he was shifting their spiritual, religious paradigm and changing things the structure and the dynamic of how people related to god and we're good what does it mean to be good how do you be good and how do you relate to god he changed that all their perspective it shifted so much to where they didn't even understand it until after the resurrection their eyes were darkened they couldn't even understand it because they weren't given the holy spirit they were still unaware so here's so in the new testament paul writes in colossians to try to back it up just a little bit he tries to um explain to them this whole thought process because there were still judaistic Ju you know, Judaism was still around, and they were still saying you got to worship on this day, so they had to bring some correction. So here's what he says. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink, or for not celebrating cer certain holy days or new moon ceremonies, or what? Or Sabbath. So he's like, look, that's like not it. You can't be condemned for not obeying a Sabbath or a ceremony or some sort of holy days and festivals that the Jews did. You can't. No. And he tells us why in the next verse. He says, for these rules... Or only what? They're shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. So what does a shadow literally do? A shadow blocks the light. Did you hear what I said? That's what, when we operate by the rules and by the law, and we try to earn God and try to, like, like we're literally blocking the light. You're operating by a flawed system. When you're focused so much on the rules 
in the law. It's a system that actually isn't even in operation today. Jesus came and instituted a new paradigm, a new way of relating to the Father. That's why in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. You can't. You can't be right just by focusing on the rules and obeying all the laws. Galatians chapter 5, 14. These aren't in your notes. Just some extra notes, uh, scriptures for you. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. This is what Jesus, this is the paradigm Jesus gave us. Love your neighbor. That's the entire law. Love your neighbor. Okay, John chapter 13, later on in the Gospel of John, he'll say this. Jesus will say this. This is where this paradigm comes from. Jesus' words. A new command I give to you. So they got all these commands. You got a lot of them, by the way. And then the Pharisees added to a lot of them. I'm giving you a new one. This is the one. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Okay? And we see, like in this interrogation, there's these legalistic leaders who cannot see with eyes of love. This guy's been blind his whole life and can see for, I don't know, minutes. And the religious leader is looking on, blind to see the reality of what's happening. And so, so the question of the old covenant, the question of the old covenant would be like, this is what they would ask. What does the law require? That's the question. That they, like, okay, whenever, that's why they would take them to the Pharisees. They would take people like, like this guy to the Pharisee. What does the law require? What does he got to do? What does, the law, what does the law require? Okay, a modern translation, maybe modern version of that same posture before God is, what does the Bible require? Now, you got the right textbook you got the wrong heart posture. Because the Bible is not a list of requirements. It's not a list of rules. That's not, what, that's, that, that's not at all what Jesus came and instituted. There's a, there's a new covenant question, or I would say the Jesus question is this. What does love require of me? The, the only requirement in Christ and in the new covenant is love. The Bible is still our textbook. But the Bible is not a list of rules to be followed or requirements to be adhered. The Bible teaches us how to love. Are you seeing it? Because if you, if you can catch this, if you can, this will change your entire life. It will change how you relate to people, how you relate to God. If you could ask yourself the right question and stop letting these rules and laws deflect the light from coming through. Man, what does love require of me? That's, that's the question. Okay. Let's pick it up, verse 17. The, the interrogation continues. So they turn to the blind man again, and they're like, what have you to say about him? That's Jesus. It was your eyes that were open, the man replied. Well, I think he's a prophet. He's got to be a prophet. He, like, he healed me. So they still did not believe that he had been blind and that he received sight until they sent for the man's parents. So they're like, well, let's ask mom and dad, man. Is this, is this real? Next verse. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was blind? Are you sure he was blind even? They're like, how is it that he can now see? Verse 20. We know he's our son, the parents answered. And we know, yes, he was born blind. But how can he see now or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Won't you ask him? He's a grown man. You know, he'll, he'll speak for himself. The next verse says that his parents actually said that to the Pharisees because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Look at this. Be because they had already decided they had already made up their mind before interrogating, investigating, before looking at the facts, before seeing what was very apparent before them, which was a miracle. They had already made up their mind that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogues. They'd be excommunicated, kicked out of the church. They had already made up their mind. This is called confirmation bias. You ever heard of confirmation bias? Let me, let me define it for you. This is what confirmation bias is. It's when you select information that supports your views, ignoring contrary information. Or when you're, you interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting your existing belief. You see this on the news all the time. You see this on social media all the time. All the time. It's, it's they're taking information with already, con, con, and interpreting it to confirm what they already want. 
So what is absolutely apparent is this man has been healed and can now see. But because he was healed on the Sabbath, then it can't be uh, from God. and He's got to be the devil. So that confirms, no, no, he's of the devil. It's, it's they've already in their minds made up what they want to do. They already made it up. So here's number two, the be careful. Be careful that your brain doesn't prevent your belief. Now, I'm not saying you need to ditch your brains to believe, but here's what I am saying. Your mind, your brain is a very, very powerful thing. The Pharisees, it prevented them from seeing what was right in front of them. It prevented them from seeing what is apparent to you and us in hindsight today. Let's contrast that with the man who was born blind. Look at this next verse in verse 24. A second time they summoned the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Tell us what we want to hear. He's bad. And he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, look what he says, I don't know. Listen to me, I want you to hear this. I don't have to understand everything to believe something. You hear that? I don't have to, comprehension is not a prerequisite for participation. I don't have to be able to explain everything to believe what's right before my eyes. I don't have to be able to explain how everything worked out and why it worked out. And why something happened, I don't have to understand it to believe it. And here's the good news for some of you. You don't either. For some of you, you're, you wit, like your brain is preventing you from believing. You would love for some of you, I think, to even come back to faith that are in this room today, but your brain is preventing you because you're going, I don't understand it. I just, I just can't, I don't get it. I don't get how. Okay, why? And you have a lot of questions that are maybe unanswered, but you're on the outside looking in, and you, you, like for some of you, you even miss some of the stuff. You miss the energy, you miss maybe the community, but something happened. You gotta, because you gotta understand. You're telling yourself at least, I gotta understand to believe it. And this guy goes, look, I don't, how? I don't know. And then he says this, one thing I do know. Look, there's a lot I don't know. I'm just, can I be honest with you? There's a lot I don't know. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Why did this happen? Why was I born blind? Why was I, was this my family situation? Why did, why did this? Why did that? Why did, look, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. But this one thing I do, I'm not going to focus on what I don't know. I'm going to focus on what I do know. There's a lot I don't know, but this one thing, this one thing, what do you say? This one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. This is, this is most of our story, those of you that are in Christ today, right? This is our story. I don't understand how it happened. I don't know. I can't explain it all. But I just know something happened. Like something happened in, in, in my life. I was blind. I can't explain it. I don't understand it. But all I know, I was in a season in my life where I felt so depressed. I was in a season. This is our story, right? I was in a season in my life. I, it was so dark. I was in a season in my life where I thought I was at the end of it. I was in a season in my life where, where my marriage, I thought it was over. I was, a, I was in a season where I was so controlled by this addiction. And then all of a sudden, I just cried out to God. Or, or, or I went to church, right? Or I hit my knees and I just opened my, and then, and I don't know how, I don't know how to explain it, but something happened and I just, he's changed me. That's your, and, then, and then when people like ask you about what happened, you even acknowledge the gap. You're like, I don't know, I don't know. Like, like they're like, what happened? You're like, dude, it's just God. I don't know. I can't explain it all. But all I know is I would never go back to where I was. I would never go back. Amen. It's only because of the grace of a merciful and loving God that He's inviting me into a relationship with the Father that I am who I am and where I am today. All I know is this: I was blind, but now I see. I was blind. His story is our story, right? It, it, it really is. And perhaps that's why John is in no hurry at all to tell us this story. I mean, he takes, what is it, 12 verses to describe how water became wine. The very first miracle of Jesus, 12 verses. Six verses to tell about Jesus walking on water. That's a pretty awesome story. Six verses. He takes 41 verses to tell us about this man who Jesus found, who was born blind. Found him, cured him, and then we're going to see he matured him. Why? why? Why take so much time on this one? I believe it's because what Jesus did physically for this man, he always intended and desired to do spiritually for every one of his followers. That he wanted to awaken something, to restore our sight. 
Let's look at it. Verse 34. Let's come back to it. To this they replied, the religious leaders to him, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they throw him out. And it says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of God? Verse 36. Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one who's speaking to you right now. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Then Jesus says, then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment. So here's the judgment he rendered. To give sight to the blind. Back up. To give sight to the blind. And, to, and not just physical sight, spiritual. To give sight to the blind and to show those who think they see that they're actually blind. And so the next verse, some of the Pharisees were standing in earshot and they go, hey, you talking about us? Was that a jab at us, Jesus? And they're... And so Jesus turns to them in verse 41. Again, he's not pulling any punches or anything now. He's like, look, go ahead, next verse. If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. But you remain guilty because you are blind and you can, you're claiming that you can actually see. So this is, this is the sign. This is the glory that's being revealed. He's the light of life, but this is, he, I think, he, John's taking the time to show us that it was God's intention and desire always to open our spiritual eyes. So here's, here's the third, the last feeling for you. Don't, don't check out on me, though. Come on. Number three, be careful. You think you have sight, but you're actually blind. That spiritual blindness, it, it can steal your understanding. That you can, Jesus can be right in front of you. The miracle can be right in front of you. The sign could be right in front of you. And you can't even see it or interpret it because you think that you see. You think your sight is fine, but you don't have the light of the world. You're just casting a shadow. You can't see. What causes this spiritual blindness, what causes it in the Pharisees, is still what causes it today, is sin and rebellion. Rebellion against God. I don't want Him, don't want His way. Sin in our heart and life. And there's only one way to open the eyes of the blind. Only one way that you can actually get spiritual sight and begin to understand and see and hear from God and connect those dots. There's only one way. And it's, it's a word that you probably don't like too much. Or maybe you have a bad taste in your mouth. That sounds, that may be a religious word for some of you, repent. And I just, it's not. It's really not. All it means is to, if I could use the analogy today, all it means is to acknowledge you're blind. That you can't see. I mean, you're acting like you see. I mean, I was there too. Sometimes I, I get there still. I'm like, oh, I act like I see. But I can't. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know my future. I can't predict it. I don't know it. I'm not the beginning and the end. I am not timeless. I am not omniscient and omnipotent. I, I can't see. And I need him to open my eyes. Now today that's a decision that every one of us, I think that's why John's writing it, taking the time. That's a decision that you need to make. If you want God to open your eyes so that you can actually discern and see and understand and hear from him. Stop acting like you're, you, you got 2020 when you know you don't. Can I pray that over your life? Come on, will you bow your heads and close your eyes all over this place? And just take a moment, take a moment, take a moment just to hear from God. Because I think there are some people in here today with every head bowed and eye closed. Who, you've been groping around in the darkness for a while. And, and you're afraid of taking the next step. And some of you, listen, some of you already, you need to go by what you hear. Like, you, are, you need to start working it. You need to start walking by faith and not by sight. You don't need them to get to where God has called you to go. You don't need it. 
You need to stop sitting and complaining and criticizing and, and blaming them for, for where you are and who you are and what happened to you. You need to get up and walk by faith and not by sight.